PNZ space again. Gets the pass away for Lampy. Oh, 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 welcome to the All Black Podcast. First show for 2021. I'm your host, Rob Dunn, and lucky to have a great guest in the studio to kick it off this year. Current All Black selector, former All Black legend Grant Fox. Welcome to the studio, mate. Thanks, Rob. Nice to be here. Mate, firstly, um, you know, we always hear about the lads getting a bit of an off-season, some of the things they get up to, follow a bit of social media, see what the boys have been doing. What about yourself? Do you get to close the laptop, have a little bit of time off, play a little bit of golf? From a rugby point of view, yes. I mean, I, I run a business, so, you know, I'm deeply involved in that. Yep. Get a summer holiday. We've got a place at Waihi Beach, which we enjoy and get the family down to, and I cut short a bit this year, sadly, because my wife's mother passed away during the holidays. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I had a bit of a knee, I got a knee problem, or had oh. one, it's getting a little bit better, but I sort of had chronic knee problems most of last year, so I didn't play a lot of golf a little bit, um, but really just enjoyed great weather, um, you know, having family, we've got grandchildren now, which is really neat, so just, you know, neat stage of life for us. And I know because you've got um, a son who plays some excellent golf, and while probably been really difficult for him with COVID, not being able to get around the world as much as he normally does, the, uh, the upshoot of all that is... You know, he's around, get to see him a bit more, get to see family a little bit more, and when the when the knee allows you, get to play a few more rounds of golf with him. Yeah, I don't get so much with him. He's, he plays <laughs> a lot. He plays with his mates. He's at home at the moment. He's, so he's done a little bit of travelling this year already to the Middle East, but, you know, he's had to do MIQ, and he did that last year at the end of, the, end of last year as well. He's got a little one too, so, you know, oh. um, little Isabel, she's um, about two months old. So he's enjoying being at home for that, but... Sooner or later, he's going to have to head north um, because this is what he does for a living. And so while he's not playing, he's not earning. So um, he's just got to figure that out because he doesn't really want to travel on his own again. Yeah, He'd like to take wife and daughter with him. And, yeah. um, you know, that's the UK, which is <laughs> not so flash at the moment. So, yeah, a little bit for him to figure out. Yeah, but it was pretty exciting, though, the other day. I, I follow the golf, particularly on a Monday, Sunday night or a Monday morning when they're getting to the final rounds. And yeah. to see him in the leaderboard mixing up with names and playing groups like Dustin Johnson's got to be pretty proud and pretty exciting for the old man. Yeah, I mean, it was some sleepless nights. <laughs> <laughs> but pleased for him. You know, he works hard. And, you know, the first tournament he missed the cut wasn't so good. The second one, you know, sort of um, mid-ish field. And the third one, you know, is at the front for a while and um, mixing up with the big boys, as you said. But if you you know... If, the start of the week, if someone would have said to Ryan in the field they had there, oh. will you take tied six and not hit a golf ball? He would have said, hell yes. So uh, so he's pretty happy. Yeah, mate. It was an amazing field, wasn't it? Probably one of the strongest fields you see in a European tournament. Uh, yeah. I, I would, uh, apart from the majors, yep. um, and you know, perhaps the strongest field in, in world golf is the players, which is on this yeah. weekend, and maybe the PGA, because you, all the professionals get these other qualifications for um, you know, the other majors. Um, but... Outside of the majors Ryan's play, that may be the strongest field he's been in. So um, he, did, he did well in that company. And I know we uh, unfortunately couldn't have the tournament last year. It's an awesome tournament, New Zealand Open. It's a fantastic format. You are you in a 12-month, what, what are we now, sort of 11, 12-month recovery phase to get back and play with Ryan in the New Zealand Open February next year, I think it is? Yeah, I haven't done that for, uh, for <laughs> a year now. I had a couple of years playing with him. Initially, I... I um, um, just wanted to either caddy for him or watch him. I didn't want to distract him, but he was more than happy to play with me when John Hart suggested that you know would you like to team up. So that was a thrill. Yeah. Um, but you know he's um, he, you know for the, what's best for the tournament at times it's better he pairs with some other celebrity so to yeah. speak. So yeah. um, anyway, you know, the New Zealand Open has been interesting for him because he hasn't done as well as he'd like yeah. often enough, and he's a tournament he's desperate to win. So um, made it hard the last couple of years because he's come straight from Mexico yeah. and got off a plane and then you know tried to make it work. Michael Hendry did it one year and, and actually won it. So can be done. Ryan just Ryan just hasn't got that across the line yet. Oh, and as you know, this is not a golf podcast, but there's uh, <laughs> the one thing you notice when you follow a bit of golf, and I'm lucky enough to go down and watch New Zealand Open a couple of times. The standard of golf is high, so you need to make sure that your preparation's right. All those things you've just spoken about, you can't just rock in as a high-ranking player and win. You got to no, get it all right, don't you? No, because look, there's, there's a hell of a lot of good players out there, uh, and, and in strong fields, and uh, these guys, you know, like rugby players, they have, they fluctuate in form. And, you know, when they're on, you know, I mean, the best in the world are more consistently on, you know. Um, the ones who, you know, maybe are a, a, a touch below that, they'll have their day in the sun during their career at, at some point. So um, that's just the way it rolls. Um, and look, I'm, I mean, what do you want for your kids? Happy and healthy and chasing their dream? Yep. Um, so we couldn't be proud of Orion because that's what he's doing. 
Brilliant. Mate, for you, there was um, you tried to retire uh, as All Black selector, I think, after the 2019 World Cup, but you're, yeah. you know, you're back doing it and you're doing yeah. it again this year. Is that, um, was that just to keep some familiar faces in the group? You know, there's always a bit of change after a World Cup with players yeah. leaving and, and a change of coach. You just wanted to keep a bit of continuity for the side? Well, it's probably more a question for Fozzie, to be perfectly right, honest. Right. Um, but, you know, to, to, to sort of thumbnail sketch it, um, you know, Fozzie asked me if I would stay on. You know, once he'd got into, you yep. know, because I'd said goodbye to the team after the World we'll Cup in Japan. You know, when you're leaving, you get a chance to say goodbye, and the boys respond for with a hug. It's a very emotional time. Um, but you know, my time was up; it was time to move on. But then, Foz had an eye on someone, and I won't say who. Right. Um, but that person wasn't available. And he said, "Mate, can, would you just mind helping out for another year?" That was the plan. Another year, um, but we had a re- really different year. Yeah. Um, and then that, that person still not available. So, um, yeah, here I am again. <laughs> I mean, I love it. Yeah. And I've got an awful lot of time um, for the people in the management group. I've got a hell of a lot of time for Foz. He's a, he's a heck of a good person. Uh, and I think he's a very good football coach. So, um, here I am again. Yeah, mate. And in the last year, like you say, crazy year last year. Like, you know, I suppose all in all, pretty happy to get a bunch of international games in, really, in yeah. the end. Um, funny old year. Like, yeah. um, you know, for a while we thought we might have the tournament here. We ended up um, doing a lot, you know, the majority of it, all of it. In Australia, yep. Um, you know, anything, you know, your sort of review of the international season last year, anything stick out or not stick out? Oh, losing to Argentina. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. um, but you say I mean, one. yeah. Look, at the end of the day, it was always going to happen at some point, wasn't? I mean, Argentina were improving, and we got to give them credit for that. And at the same time, if you trace Argentina's recent history, they're at their best at World Cups. So it's yep. when they they get their their best players all together for an extended period of time. They had that outside of a World Cup. Um, even though you know they hadn't necessarily played a whole lot of rugby, um, they had some adversity and they reacted well to it. Um, played well that day, they beat us. I didn't think it would be in our backyard or even in Australia. I probably thought it would be in Buenos Aires, to be perfectly honest. When I'm not sure, but it was going to happen at some point. Yeah. Um, the irony is, you know, we won the trophies we played for. We kept yeah. the Bledisloe Cup, which is you know a, a high priority for us outside of World Cup years. And we had a great performance in Sydney and Auckland, for that matter, uh, and better in Sydney to do that. You know, we fluctuated in form up and down a bit, and that's a, part, a big part of the off-season review. But that's been a consistent theme to some degree for quite some time now. We just got to, you know, we got to. You can't be at your peak every time. You yep. try hard to do that. The mental side's the toughest we do. While I aspire to do that, the reality is you don't quite because we don't turn up to work every day as our best selves. It's just that's that's just reality. So we just got to get the bottom up. The, the when we're not so good, get it that a little bit better. And so that's a that's a you know big lot of work that the, co- the coaching group, management group are thinking about at the moment. Um, how to change that up to improve that. But um, you know, losing to Australia and Brisbane is not uncommon, and particularly off a great performance that you know, happened again. Um, yeah, it was the, the loss to Argentina. So we won the two trophies. I think we were. We'd beat Argentina. You know, everyone would have been a lot more happy. We lost to Argentina. A bit of grumpiness about, but that's okay. Yeah. You know, but it was a, it was a strange old year. You know? Yeah, and like you say, to perform um, consistently well over periods of time, win, win ugly sometimes and that sort of stuff, you know, perhaps yep. England are showing at the moment it's not as easy as some think. You know, they're going through a period where, you know, we all saw them on the rise and, and um, at the moment they can't win ugly. They're losing the close game, so it shows yeah. perhaps just how it is to do over well, a long time. Well, it's competitive now, and, and yeah, you hear in the rugby right now that people want it competitive. Yep. You know, they want contests. They want test matches where you're sitting on the edge of your seat. Great. Yeah. But <laughs> you've got to be careful what you wish for, eh? Because you yeah. sit at the front of the at the front of your seat, you're not always going to get the result you want. Yeah. So if that's what you want, then be prepared at times that okay, we might be disappointed. If you if you're sitting back in your seat with your arms folded, you sort of know the outcome, don't you? Yeah. yeah and yeah. maybe you know we'd been there for a little while to some degree, hadn't we? So, um, but it's getting it's getting more competitive, and that's what we want for Test rugby. For you, All Black selector, you know your job is to put together a squad with the coaches. Anyone you look back on last year and think, oh, Foxy, I got that one right. That's good, you know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we don't. We don't do it like that at all. But you know, we, um, you know, we, there's a lot of work goes into this. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of chats, a um, lot of going to games live, a uh, lot of watching on the computer and analysing stuff, and then having big discussions and chucking it all together. And you know, often the hardest thing we have to do is is who we leave out. Yeah, right. You know, in some areas where we might quite have the depth, it becomes a little more challenging about who we're going to put in. But we don't have too many of those discussions. Often it's enough about, well, you know, we only need this many in this particular yeah. sector, like the midfield. We've probably got six really good names to pick from, but we're only going to pick four. Who do we leave out? So that's a good situation to be in. 
and everyone will have their opinion about that, and that's okay. Um, you know, we've got that responsibility, and we take it seriously. And you know, we the review is always about you know, yeah, we're pleased with that. Um, maybe we'll, as a selecting group, we weren't. You know, did we get that one right? So we challenge ourselves all the time. Um, and because we're like the playing group, you know, we're we're trying to get better too. Because what is as selector, you know, what is a week for you? Because one thing I do want to ask you um, after this is sort of that your role between just selecting players yep. and getting that balance right. Because you just pointed out before, I could name eight outside backs yep. who are quality, yep. you know, and they're all different from yep. Jordy Barrett to Caleb Clark yep. to Sebi Reese all different humans, all amazing footy players. Like, What does your week look like and how much time do you spend on individual players versus how do I get the best 30 yep. or 35 players, whatever the squad is? Yeah, bear, be, bearing in mind that um, you know I've got a day job, yep. so that's um, <laughs> running a business, so that takes a fair bit of time. Um, but, but, you know, I, I get my – I'm a bit of a technophobic. I'm not great on, on the technology, so you – know, You're I, doing really well today, though. You're <laughs> killing it today. I get some help um, getting my hard drive downloaded so I've got all the games on. Sure. And then it's just – it's time on the computer, right? And I, and I, I do it in shorter chunks because doing big, long chunks, you sort yeah. of get a bit square-eyed and you lose concentration. So what I'm trying to do is do, you know, smaller chunks often – you know, diving into, you know, we don't watch every player. We're often, yep. you know, we, we, we look in the areas sometimes, particularly where it might be props, it might be loose forwards or something like that. And we're diving down. I'm making notes. I do a lot of stuff manually because that's just so, I just write myself notes. It's always good to flick back and see where players are progressing or where we think things aren't quite where they should be. And, yep. you know, I don't have those conversations with Super Rugby coaches. That's Fozzie and Plums's job not, and, and Scotty McLeod's. Yep. Uh, not my job. I'm not, not the coach and I've, very clear, clearly stay in my swim lane. My swim lane is selection. My discussions are with the other All Black selectors and Plum and and Fozzie. Uh, you know, we go to games live. You know, we we we're in the hotels. We obviously get time to chat. We chat at games. You know, we pick up the phone. We chat with each other during the week. More formally, when we come to pick it, when we're getting closer to picking a team, we spend more time as a group together going to games because it usually gets split up a little bit. Um, and just more deeper discussions, whiteboard stuff, you know. Yep. Often we're sitting in a box at Eden Park with a whiteboard and we see the fans trying to look at what yeah, we're yeah, writing, yeah. writing up. So we've got to turn that around. It's quite a hard case. But, um, yeah, the workload sort of ramps up a little bit as we get closer to picking picking yep. the group. And how much, too, do you um, sort of take into consideration the styles of rugby at the time? Like one thing that, you know, probably actually been happening now, well, in some ways probably South Africa were first um, – to do it to the All Blacks, it's definitely happened in the 2017 Lions series, it definitely happened when we played Argentina last year, is just um, not committing to rucks, getting up on the feet, rush defence, like that's a way that sometimes when the All Blacks fall over, it's because we've met a really determined line, don't commit to breakdowns, massive line speed, get up in our face and take away our ability to play, like are you really thinking about those sorts of things as well, players who can help? Uh, break that down. Yeah, well, look, that's part of this. I mean, that, how to break that down is the coaches, right? Yeah. That's that's their discussion. But you know, we're talking about players that can help do that. But but a lot of that's around strategy, not so much the talent. It's around strategy. You know, there's a lot of talk at how to do that, a lot of planning. But the reality is, when you get in the heat of the moment, yeah, it ain't it isn't it isn't as easy, is it? We can rehearse all we like and practice all we like, but at the end of the day, until it really happens, and that's in all walks of life. So. Um, you know, we, we've at times had, there's a, a misconception we don't have a lot of success when that happens because when we lose, that's what happens to us. I understand that, but they forget about against the same team where we might have, we might have beaten them heavily not that long ago. We, we, oh, we, we faced the same thing and yet we, we unlocked them, right? So, you know, you've got to give the opposition for getting maybe a little bit more accurate in that area and maybe for us mentally we weren't quite where we needed to be because we'd beaten them heavily, you know, not so long ago. And that's the mental side of the game. You know, I'm talking about, but look, we, no doubt, it's a big, strong um, person's game now. So, um, you know, in the off season, I'm not going to name names, but some of the players we had, and they've been in the gym with the yep. diet, and they put on weight yep. because that's where the game's at. Yeah, totally. And weight is muscle, right? We're not we're lean muscle. We're not looking at putting weight on for weight's sake. It's got to be in the right areas. And you know, these guys are talented rugby players, but you know, if they're a bit smaller, they're struggling against bigger men. If we can get them as you know up to the size of the opposition they're going to face and still keep their their the talent that they have, the explosiveness, then you know we've got a heck of a rugby player the site that we need at our level to compete. Yep. You know, um, smaller players at times struggle to carry that weight initially. Dane Coles is an example. We first put Coles years ago. You know, he had some weight put on him, and for half a season, he struggled like hell to carry that weight. Then then he got used to it, and he was away. Um, that was when we first picked him. So look what he's like now. Yeah, yeah, totally. Pretty special. 
And there's um, you know, Super Rugby Aotearoa has started. Yep. Um, and like you say, a lot of the boys have had an off season, a little bit of an extended off season this year. Um, to get in the gym, work on some of the things you've discussed. How? What have you thought of the first uh, few rounds of the competition? Um, played pretty high pace, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Boy, she's frenetic. Summer uh, footy, mate. Yeah, summer footy. Um, and I, I love the fact that the, the, way, the way the guys are trying to play the game. Um, and we, again, we've got talent on display, lots of talent. But at this time of the year. You know, we're just sitting back watching a little bit. We're not casting too much judgment. Often you'll find All Blacks start a little bit slower because they don't have the big off season because yep. they they get on their break and they come to it. You know, a little bit later on, and often some some people are perhaps not so well known. They put their name up in lights, and so for us, it's interesting to see how they can carry that on. Um, and obviously, you know, when you come to select an All Black team, you know, past history and our jersey and performance is also vitally important. It's part of how we judge form. We don't just judge it on what we're seeing in Super Rugby. It's form for us as well. And clearly we take a lot of notice of form in Super Rugby as well. So, um, And how do you sift through the talent? You know, it's a great it's a great position to be in. Yeah, <laughs> great position to be in. But, it, you know, it's hard when you know guys have worked their backsides off and they don't get their name read out. But, you know, our history is littered with that. Um, um, and, you know, it just makes it, a lot of them react well to it because they just fight that a little bit harder. Yeah, and I know as a selector you're, you know, absolute professional and impartial, but an Auckland man no, didn't necessarily put on the Blues jersey, but you've got to be happy with the way the Blues just to appear to be on an upward curve. You know, I think they're playing some really good rugby. They've got some big units, but um, they bring it together as well, playing some pretty expensive stuff mixed in with some pretty good grunt work as well. Yeah, oh, look, I'm pleased, pleased with the progress they made last year, obviously. Um I mean, if you if if you look at it, I mean, it's the biggest city up here, and we yep. want you know we need the rugby team to do well for rugby's sake, um, and that's for rugby across the country. So we can all have our favourites, and we should, and be a bit myopic at times. But it is important that rugby does well up here. So the Blues have struggled for quite some time. So pleased to see the real progress they're making. Now the interesting thing is this year they've 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 got expectation to live with, and yeah. they haven't had that for a while. While have they? Nah. And look, so far first game didn't look so bad. So. Um, w- 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 We'll see. Yeah, well, we were sort of denied a sort of a final last year by in the last round with the Crusaders potentially playing the Blues, and uh, who knows, maybe we'll get the opportunity. Well, the Crusaders had already nailed it, hadn't they? But it was just going to be a big game at the park, 40,000 yeah. people in. You know, the, the the winners versus the team that was you know closest to them would have been a great spectacle, but anyway. And then it got knocked out again this year. Yeah. You know, they were due to play a sort of rematch as a pre-season game, and unfortunately right. that was the, the lockdown just recently. It's the world we live in. Right, good first half of the show. A uh, quick little break. We'll come back and talk a little bit to Grant about his own playing career as a younger man. And he's very close to Grant Fox. It's going to be the snapshot. And that's Mick and Drake for Grant Fox in the All Blacks lead. Another drop kick from Fox. Lashes land, Kerwin. Oh, there's seven black shirts there. Jones. Try for Michael Jones. Kirk. Fox. Jones. Kirk. David Kirk. And through. Oh, it took a strong blow. All right, mate, like, you know, these days we see you in the box, you know, selecting sides and helping out um, the All Blacks trying to put the best squad together, but uh, it's a pretty storied rugby career uh, that you've had. Um, Maybe just talk a little bit about early years as a Fox. When I was doing a bit of research, I saw that... uh, I think uh, the birth of Grant Fox had to be done by 12 o'clock so that Dad could play rugby at one or something like that. Is that a representation of how important rugby <laughs> was to the family back in the day? Look, I, I was born um, in, in New Plymouth. So, you know, the, 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 a lot of cousins in Taranaki. Yep. Um, my father was a rugby player, played for Ocado. Um, and that's, I, I, I'm, mum's told me this story that you know, <laughs> I, it was, I was born on the day of a game and my father was able to play. And they would have been the days where the father problem, problem, probably wasn't in the birthing suite either. But yeah, anyway, yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, as far as I'm aware, that's a true story. <laughs> uh, but then we moved to um, the Waikato, a um, little place called Wotu. And yep. Wotu was a school and a garage. 
and the closest town was Pitaru, and it was about uh, nine miles from home, and that had about five thousand people. Yeah. Um, but we were brought up in a, you know, on a sheep farm, diversified into beef a little bit, you know, three hundred acre farm. So I wasn't a big farm, but we did what you know rural families did. That there was a tennis club up the road. We were a member of the tennis club, uh, the rugby club, junior rugby club. My father was still playing, but retired pretty early with three young boys. Um, played cricket. You know, my mother was a netballer, so we were just Brilliant. brought up in that environment. Yeah, goalposts on the back lawn was it? Or ah, uh, yeah, I used to build <laughs> them. We had an implement shed just up the hill a little bit, and I was um, a little bit of a uh, wannabe, you know, builder. Yeah. Uh, and and the old man gave us a lot of responsibility as kids. Yeah. You know, we were able to. He encouraged us to do things, drive the machinery. Um, you know, when we were building gates, you know, he'd yeah. he'd. He'd let me help him. So at a very young age, we were doing that sorts of things. I'd get a couple of fence battens and a bit of three by one, and and just and another batten just to lean it against on the front lawn, and I'd kick there. Eventually, after breaking so many windows, that the old man <laughs> built a, um, a proper full size set of goalposts in, in um, one of the front paddocks. Because it's what you know him for is your goal kicking. Like was that literally from day dot? As soon as you could uh, had those first set of goalposts, and as soon as you could swing the leg, that's what you were doing. Um, I guess the, the the craft always fascinated me. Um, um, and the but the earliest recollection of um, wanting to actually perhaps make it a real integral part of what I did as a rugby player was watching Barry John in the 1971 oh, Lions because you know my father laid the ball down torpedo style he was a toe hacker as they pretty much <laughs> all were then and I'd done that in bare feet so in the, in the wake out in the winter with a three degree frost it's not so good for your uh, toes and uh, I can man. remember having sprained toes and it hurt to <laughs> kick and I just saw this guy Barry John kicking a ball with his instep get pretty good at it. And I thought, oh well that my first thought was that'll save my toes. Yeah. And so that's I just copied that. Um and yeah, and just I liked it. And you know, I had a set of goalposts in the in on the front paddock and just you know, I just loved doing it. Brilliant. And it was um you know, you moved from there, you went up to Auckland Grammar and was that was that always on the cards? Was it always um you know, your parents wanted to get you into the big smoke, into a bigger school for your education. Was that something that um, your family had always done, or actually it was it was a bit of a, a new thing? Um, well, my father went to um, the Okada District High School. My mother was at New Plymouth Girls, and I think she boarded. I'm not that they live. Her father lived at um, Puniho, which is about 16 mile out. I think she was a boarder, though. I'm not quite sure about that. But I guess they just wanted to get into, you know, they believed in the quality of education, no slight on the local school, but um, they just decided they wanted to, um, I guess, to expand the horizons a little bit. As, as I understand, I think I might have got accepted at Hamilton Boys High, although I can't oh, yeah. quite remember that. But, um, you know, they were told, you know, Auckland Grammar and all their friends say, you won't get them in there. Well, luckily we Was got in. DJ it. Graham? DJ Graham, Graham yeah, yep. yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and, and look, so I was a farm boy. I'm um, going to a school of 1,200 then, and I knew one kid, <laughs> a guy called Dave Rahu, who I'd played roller mills against, and, and I Brilliant. knew nobody else. So it was a pretty daunting time for a little for a little farm boy. And straight into the hostel as well, up there, was it? Yeah, different oh, life, oh, yeah. And, 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 and hostel life then was very different oh, than it is now, right. you know. Yeah. Um, you know, the world we live in nowadays, what used to go on the hostel wouldn't be very acceptable. Uh, yeah. But it's what you knew, it's all yeah. you knew. So, you know, not condoning it, but it just it, it, it was what it was. Yeah, absolutely. And it was, because these days... Like you know better than anyone, like first fifteen rugby's a, a really big deal. The one A competition in Auckland's a really big deal. It features on Sky and and yep. um, you know was, for example, the Grammar Kings match as big a deal as it feels like it is today. Like was was that yeah. a real you know feature in the calendar? Oh look, I haven't been to a first fifteen game live here for a long time, but but it was it was our biggest game, the biggest grudge match of of the of of the year. Um, and didn't matter the relative strengths of the teams, it was the big grudge match. You know, they had a big hostel at that time. They had about 400 kids in the hostel. They used to do huckers then and shake the ground, you know, and there were probably possibly five odd thousand people at the game. Wow. You know, it was the game, and we had a small boarding establishment. There was only 90 of us. Um, but they had to turn up as well and you know, go through their chance. It was it was a traditional big game, big fixture of, of our calendar. Yeah. And was it um in a big school like that, um, you know, particularly coming from such a small community was was a sport effectively that gave your community gave you some mateship gave yep. you a group of fellows to get around with you know yeah it did um absolutely so i mean I, the, my earliest recollection because it was summer when we arrived so i did play a bit of cricket but just going in the athletics champs you know just to yeah because you're just you know, fancy little a little skinny kid that, yeah. and and my school was quite fast it wasn't very fast at all grammar <laughs> i can tell you that you know um i did come third in the long jump though so oh, there was okay. something yeah, yeah but but it wasn't i mean athletics wasn't really my thing but you know we're boarding up in a sporting environment so yeah you know have a crack at it, that did help get to know people. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And as uh, for you, 
Um, always got to ask these questions of former players. Success in the Kings game? Did you did you knock that one off? Or yeah, uh, two out of three years. Um, we had a draw one year. My fault. I missed a conversion <laughs> that I should have got. Um, um, but yeah, two out of three years. We uh, in my first fifteen years, we we won and won, won draw at Kings. Fantastic. And I want to. Um I want to fast forward really to like, geez, doing some research, I realised what a significant part of your rugby career it was, but playing for Auckland, like, um, you know, the game that I don't know if I, if I remember it, you know, watching it per se, because I was Mm -hmm. five years old, but I certainly remember just clip after clip and show after show about the 85 Shield game, game of the century, 52,000 people Mm. at Mm. Lancaster Park in those (laughs) days, phenomenal, like, um, was... You know, was that bigger than Ben Hur? You know, like the lead up to that sort of match. You know, because I know, and looking through the record books, it was a couple of years all earlier. A, a really good Auckland side came to Lancaster Park, lost thirty-one nine. Yep, and it had it had some fantastic players in it. Yourself, Andy Hayden, J.K. You know, mm. a lot of big names. Um, and you're a good side. Was was the lead up to that eighty-five game as big as it looked? Because it literally looked like um, you could not get any more people into that rugby ground. Yeah, I mean, we were aware of the occasion. We'd gone down in 83 with high hopes and a good side and got spanked. You know, maybe we went down just expecting to win. And, you know, maybe even, um, we might even talked it up a little bit. Um, (laughs) You know, a fatal mistake. And and, um, we got a hiding handed to us. So, you know, even though it was two years later, that was pretty fresh in our mind. Um, And so it was a different build-up, very intense um, build-up, but much more um, sort of downplayed from a media perspective from our point of view. And, you know, we jumped out of 24 nil at half time and got up to 28 nil. I think I missed a really simple conversion because um, it's like the game's won. Yeah. Sort of. And then they came roaring back at us, you know, 28 23. And I still remember it's a great bit of strategy by Wayne Smith because what do you think they're going to do there? They're going to try and run the ball. Smithy hoisted it. Yeah. Great brain, Smithy. And we were scrambling, you know. <laughs> oh, my God, you know. Um, and, you know, I, I, you know, I guess in a way we got out of jail, but it's still. It's called the game of the century, I think, for good reason. You know, fifty-two thousand people at the park. Um, get to classic game of two halves. Yeah. Old rivals really going at it. Um, but little did you know, and that was, I think, they were on the end of a great era. I think they may yeah. have equalled Auckland's previous. I think that was or, to or go ahead it. of the, Maybe, the great not yet, Fred, Fred Allen's team. Era, yeah. yeah. Um, and look, who was to know what to come? It was the start of a great era for us with the Shield. Yeah, absolutely. And there's um, like, you know, ex- there's great stories in Canary that you know. Grizz walks into the changing shed and says, here's the ball, now go get it. And yeah. that's all he said, and, and Canary came out. But was there a bit of, shit, we've got this in the bag, the job's done, and you, you took the, the foot off the pedal? Because the no. final shots of yeah. JK just floundering yeah. to get the ball over the, yeah. the dead ball line. And Matt, it all feels like the crowd's actually over the dead ball line. It was that manic at the end of the game. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, certainly not games in the bag. I mean, that would yeah. never be the message a coach would give. It's like, yeah. you know, we'll bank it, but start again. I can't remember specifically. And those, obviously, it was a five minute half time, you're on the field. Yeah. The rumour we hear about Alex's um, uh, half time talk, if it's true, doesn't surprise me yeah. because yeah. at times, <laughs> yeah. you know, I mean, Alex was a man of, of few words, great rugby brain, man of few words. Actually, didn't need it. He didn't need to say much to get his message across. So that wouldn't be surprised if that's what he said. Yeah. Um, I can't remember what ours is like, but it, you know, subconsciously, yeah. and look, we've seen it recently with All Blacks. I mean, a few times against Australia, we've been up by plenty at yeah. half time, and then we've had a poor second half. No matter how much you talk about it, subconsciously, it is hard to jump over that hurdle. That probably happened to us a long time ago, so I'm not. I'm struggling to remember it properly, but yeah, it was a great occasion. The thing too, you notice when well, obviously the physiques are different because professional rugby players these days they're big, they're muscular, you know, they're bigger, faster, stronger. But the thing you really notice when you watch the clips is just the sheer brutality. Like yeah. there is atrocities going on yeah. at every breakdown. Like when that opening whistle goes, there is just bodies flying everywhere. And I'm sure as a, you know, a blonde-headed small first five, you probably got called out for a bit of attention every now and again in some of those games because it seemed like, um, you know, certain things that will be picked up today did not. Yeah, stru- look, structures in the game, the way it's played is different. I mean, the, the object of the game, kick, run, pass, tackle, in no particular order is... is is essentially the same, you know, try and score a try, kick a goal. I mean, what you're trying to do is the same thing. But the athletes have changed, and so have the way the game's play. The way the game's played has changed, so the structure of it, right? So the five eights have got to defend wider now, yep. you know, rather than narrow like we did. And, you know, I often made sure that Michael, <laughs> yeah, the ice man, was standing beside me to give me a hand. It the, 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 wasn't the strongest part of my game. Um, um, so that 
that that's I mean it's just the way it is. Yeah. It is just we just have to accept. I mean when the game went professional and yeah. this is what these guys do for a living, it was an inevitable that if you can commit all your pretty much all your time to it, to getting stronger, bigger, um, fitter, faster, uh, more skillful, possibly um, not always, but possibly yeah. um, um, certainly there's possibly generally more skill right across the board yeah. because of these guys this is what they do for a living. Yeah. Um, it's interesting no, noting now with the way the breakdown's being refereed. I just I get a sense there's a little touch of heat being taken out of it. So you see, referees are really hot at the moment here in New Zealand anyway, on hands past the ball. Yeah, they are. Anything, like, Anything. looks like you're holding your own body weight. Yeah, or, and or if you if you even if you're not holding your own bo- even if you're holding your own body, but your hands yes. are past the ball, and, and if there's a clear lift, it's a penalty quickly. So in a way, it may have taken a bit of that yeah. that real heat out of that collision post the tackle. You know, because that's when it's sometimes it's most dangerous. Um, so we'll see how this unfolds. But and the penalty count's pretty heavy at the moment. But like last year, it was, and then the players adjusted. We're still getting some pretty good footy for it, though. Yeah, I mean, you could, the thing you can tell straight away from watching some of the highlights from back in the day is under the same training regime that the players have today, a Michael Jones or Warwick Taylor Correct. or any of those guys Absolutely. would be elite rugby players. There's uh, no doubt about it. I yeah. mean, Mock Jones was elite anyway without Look, the gym. Colin Meads would still be great. Yeah. Ian Kirkpatrick would still be great. Brian Lahore would still be great. So they, you know, I mean, they were great in their day. So that's why when people try and say that you make comparisons, it's like, well, you just got to compare them in the era they were in. Yeah. Were they dominating? Were they world class? Were they the best in the world? If they are that in that era, then you know damn well with Jim, do this for a living, yeah. eat, you know, lift weights. Yeah. more time to do it, they would be just as great nowadays. 100%. And like that was, as you just touched on before, that was the first game of 61 defences, of which you played 57. Mm-hmm. Um, geez, you managed to keep yourself reasonably injury free, didn't don't you? Tackle, don't tackle, don't <laughs> tackle. I'll get to that actually, but then there's uh, <laughs> 932 points, like just a metronome, like did you, um, just a special group of players, eh? Like you just created a culture where you obviously, because a little bit like you were talking about before, I'm sure, good team, but there would have been games in there where you were seriously challenged, yeah. but you were able to keep a standard that allowed you to. I'm sure you had a bunch of close games during that time. Oh, the, the, the first two were tough. Right. Um, and look, I'm trying to remember. It was, I can't remember whether it was Waikato or Counties with the first one, but, but I mean, you know, maybe County should have won that game. It may have been the first defence. We right. didn't win by much, and maybe we got a bit lucky on the right side of a refereeing decision, you know. And you always, in many ways, I've always felt that shield teams are the most vulnerable in their second game. Right. So they get as a defender, you get up for the first game because you've been at the pub since you, Tuesday. Yeah, or but you get up for <laughs> it and you go. But it's the second game when you go, oh god, thank god we didn't yeah. let it go so quickly. So it may well have been that Counties was our second game at first. I can't quite remember. It was a long time ago now. But look, we were a side that, you know, every now and again a team will have an era yeah. um, where. You're fortunate enough to have a whole lot of great players avail- you know, around all at the same time. A lot of these players were world class. You would, you know, they were all blacks too, but you would have picked them in a world fifteen. Yeah. So you got to give guys like you know John Hart started this, um, selecting, coaching, um, handed over to Morris and Brian. You know, did a great job carrying that on because you don't. Sometimes you see a, a great era not quite yeah. kick on. You know Morris and Brian's era, um, as the best as I can remember, was played. They coached for five years. Either played ninety. 186, drew one, lost three. Wow. Um, pretty good. Um, but we, we had a good side. Um, very dedicated side. Brutal on each other. We were tough on each other. Almost elements of professionalism before it was professional? Uh, professionalism is an attitude. Yeah. And so from an attitude point of view, I think that we had, a, we had a group of guys of very similar who drove each other. When I said we were brutal on each other, we were. You know, we pushed each other really hard and still remain good mates because we understood that that happened across the paint. That's what that was about, We're all just trying to get better. We had a common goal that we wanted this team to do well. Um, and off the off the paint, you know, um, different environment <laughs> those days, so yeah, we, had a lot, we had a lot of fun together. All Black debut, do you remember it? Was it on Feature. the radio? Was it phone phone call? Like? Oh, to get selected, you mean? Yep. Uh, on the radio. On the radio. Mm. Read out, list them with the family yep. or something? Uh, no, I, I, well, my, my family were in the Bay of Plenty at that point, so I was in Auckland. I was at um, my girlfriend's place, um, uh, soon, very soon to become my wife. At her parents' place in Waterview, um, yeah. and it was about two o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, and it was on the radio when the name was read out. So I had no no inkling beforehand. A lot of talk around the media that yeah, you know maybe I'd get selected, but yeah, it was um, I heard it live on the radio. Yeah, and uh, 
you know, everything you thought it would be, can't remember it, nervous, all that stuff that people so often say about their first game? Yeah, the 98 4 to Fiji. So that was, um, you know, end of, end of the NPC season, went to Fiji. Uh, first game was in Nandi. Yeah, Nandi. Can't go there now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and it was, a, it was a Fijian selection side, I think. But oh, yeah. I have a, vi- I have, there's not a lot I remember about the game, but I have a really vivid memory. We're staying at the hotel. I'm pretty sure I was rooming with Wayne Smith. Oh, yeah. He was the incumbent. And Smithy came to me on the morning of the match and um, wanted my boots. I said, what for? He said, I'll clean your boots for you. I found, and, and I was fastidious about, I always wash my laces. I'd, I'd yep. nugget my boots all, you know, I'm mean, going to do the laces the night before, let them dry, yep. nugget the boots on the game. And, and I, I'm pretty sure I said, no, Smithy, I got it. But it was just an interesting little insight for me that he was the incumbent, I was the new boy, but he was going to do everything he could to make sure that I was ready to go. There's you plenty know. of those little tidbits around Wayne Smith yeah. around, isn't oh, yeah. there? What a yeah. quality yeah. man yeah. he is. He's a selfless man. Yep. And, you know, it wasn't long after that, the inaugural, you know, 1987 Rugby World Cup. And, yep. you know, today it's you'll hear people like Dan Carter, Richard McCall reference it as maybe the first time they remember watching the All Blacks, you know, thinking, geez, that's what I want to do and a bit of motivation for them to want to grow up and be All Blacks leading into the tournament because it's the first one. Yeah. Um, did you have a sense of... of this being a particularly big occasion, or was it like we're just going to go out there and play hopefully five or six test matches and do well? Uh, I'm not sure we had any expectations because yeah. it was the first one we didn't know. I mean, yeah. you know, 1986 hadn't been an easy year for New Zealand rugby. No, that's right. Um, and I think out of that, I'm a great believer that you you know you you, get, you learn more from adversity than yeah. success. So a lot of adversity. Um, you know, the 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 selection group picked you know a strong squad of players. Uh, we we're a very fit group, um, very. Uh, understanding of how we wanted to play the game, players would pick to play that that, that game. Um, but you know, it was Friday the twentieth of May, to the best of my knowledge, at Eden Park playing Italy. Yeah, and it was half full. We didn't know what yeah. to expect. You yeah, know, um, I really, I think the thing that lit the World Cup up was J.K.'s try. The best re- yeah, uh, assist, I, I, Grant. The best pass, Grant Fox has ever thrown. Yeah, I did know, throw it to him. Good a throw. <laughs> Kirky threw it to me, and I threw it to That's J.K. Right. No, but, I've um, seen it many times. Um, and then the only person who could track him was Michael Jones. Yeah, of course. No one else could. AJ, AJ will tell you all day long he could, but <laughs> <laughs> it's not a hope in hell he could. Um, but Michael Jones, but very special. I think that lit it up, to yeah. be perfectly honest. But it was, only, you know, we were touring in our own backyard. Yeah. You know, all Blacks don't, but basically don't do that. Yeah. Um, but that, it sort of built in momentum, as I guess. We, we played, uh, we, we got good results. We played good footy. Yeah. Um, you know, culminating in, in the win against France. Mate, for you, 126 points at the tournament, 17 the final. That still remains a tournament record for the most scored at a tournament, which is awesome. But the the final, when you go back and look at it, you know, you read the scorebook now, I think it was 29-9 yep. or something like that. Um, and it seems quite convincing over the French. But actually, it was it was a grind, wasn't it? It wasn't until David First Kirk, half, was yeah. it? Um, First 50 minutes or so was a real grind. And we, we had the wind at our back. It wasn't a big wind, but yep. a little bit typical South West of Eden Park. And there's a little bit of moisture about it. It wasn't the perfect day. And we were only up 10-9-0, 9-3. 9-3 it might nine have been three, at half time. Um, and um, so we had a lot of work to do. Yep. Uh, and look, we it, it, it was, you know, Kirky unlocked them. Yep. And then it, then it was just it was a bang bang twice you know we went back got from the kickoff, I think yeah and two quick tries and that was the game so and up they sort of took the wind out of their sails but and the Fr- as the French are wont to do they often save their best for us yeah. <laughs> and they totally. were cer- they were certainly doing that but I have also great recollections of of the semi final France Australia so yeah, people shouldn't game. forget what a great game of rugby yep. everyone was on Australia they thought Australia would win but France again Surge just in the pulled corner. yeah France just pulled out what they what was that thirty to twenty four I think they just pulled out what they're capable of doing yeah um, maybe they struggled to really get there a week later but they weren't far away because you know, we were under a lot of pressure for fifty minutes. Oh yeah, I think I've often heard um, people say sometimes we see them as a bogey team. We don't necessarily appreciate what a good rugby nation they are. Like they continually pump out good players and good yeah. sides, and, and it looks like France might be on the upward curve yeah. again. Wow, well, they look impressive, so, don't yeah, they? No, they're doing yeah, they some do. Pretty I mean, young but, team, uh, but you know, but there were a lot of expectation in their own backyard, and yeah. they haven't always been the best under that expectation. But I sense there's something different about about this group under Gaultier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it'll be really interesting to see their progress. And the other, the thing that um. You know, the thing I want to really want to chat about is, um, and we don't, don't don't do it as much these days, unfortunately. But the good, the bad, and the rugby, and blood, sweat, and tears. I think mm-hmm. they're two of the greatest sporting videos that are uh, yeah. that ever went out. And what you get from that straight away, um, and hopefully a lot of this remains, is obviously you don't tour as much as you used to in All Black these days. But you look like a bunch of guys who really got along well. 
But when you cross the line, it was all on, and you're very, very competitive for places. I think a little bit what you talked about with Smithy, when you get off the field, opportunity to have yeah. a beer, spend some time together, and actually, I'm sure those sort of tours um, created real mates, didn't it? Yeah, like, that's what it looked like. We, I mean, we don't have those tours nowadays. Yeah. So the guys still travel a lot, but they don't have these big long stints away like we used to have, although to be fair... You know, that was um, my longest tour was in uh, 92 to Australia and South Africa. That was nine weeks. Wow. Right. So we think that's a long time. What about three or four months? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or what were yeah. the 24 Invincibles? Yeah, God knows yeah. how long. Five or six months. Gone you know? for five I mean, years, my, I think. My, yeah. my father in law played uh, cricket for New Zealand for a long time. He went away in the 1949 tour to um, uh, the UK. He'd been married for six months and he disappeared for eight months on, t- on tour, you know. So. We think nine weeks was a long time. Yeah, yeah, hardly scratching the surface. But look, the times were different then, yeah. you know, and you could tell by those videos. And I can't remember um, when I was helping Peter Sloan with the Blues. We That's one, so ma- good. one match day morning, we disappeared, you know, out for coffee and line outs and that out of the hotel up Waitakere somewhere. And in the bus, we were playing these videos. And um, one of the boys, when we got off the bus, he said, God, you guys drank a lot of piss. Didn't you? <laughs> 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 it's just like, well. We probably did, but yeah. it was just, that was the environment, you know. I mean, nowadays that would be frowned upon, and with social media you get potted all day long, but it was just different then, yeah. you know. So you only know what you know, and that's what we knew then. Ah, oh, so it was a different time, and you, there's no point comparing, but it was pretty right. cool to see as young fella, you got to see a bit of the personality of some of the lads, and, you know, some of the videos with oh, yeah. Bernie McCarthy and Bash reenacting the, the thiefery and like on yes. tour, they were absolutely yeah. hilarious. And Zinni falling off the donkey. <laughs> no, that's no. right, mate. It was so good. But mate, the ninety one World Cup completely yep. different. We've got one under the belt. We understand yep. it's a big deal, you know, yep. and it's in it's in the big market. You know, it's yep. where all the people are. England, Wales, you know, all love their footy. Um, was there, you know, did you feel a bit of pressure being the defending champions going into um, a place now where we knew what we're getting ourselves in for? We felt pressure as All Blacks, like we always yep. feel. So yep. you know, um, defending champions we were, but but you don't you're not you're not going out defending the World Cup because you've got to go to a qualifying. Did you have that sort of mentality then? Because I know we talk about we hear that <coughs> sort of stuff a lot now. But, you know, you were still amateur then. You still yep. didn't spend as much time together as you did then. Like, did, were you yep. still, um, those sort of mantras still existed then? Yeah, they did. Because we, we just, I mean, there's an expectation on the All Blacks. Yep. Um, World Cup was the biggest stage. We'd had one, so we knew what it was about. You know, but we were a side starting to struggle. That was obvious. Yep. And I don't want to, you know, download, go into yeah, all yeah, sorts yeah. of reasons why. Because everyone will have a different view on that, perhaps. You know, but the bottom line, um, we were struggling. Um, we got to Australia. They, they were a team, you know, on the up, yeah. um, and they dealt to us in Dublin, yeah. um, and you know, so that was the end of the road for us. I mean, we'd put an all, we played England in the first match at Twickenham. We, we played, put, we put a hell of a lot into that game, totally, you know. And then the next few games weren't supposed to be quite so difficult. We struggled against Italy, and then the quarter, oh, I can't remember the next Canada. game. Uh, quarter final was Canada, you know, and the wet, wet and Lille. yeah. Um, you know, so we, we we were just struggling, and and, and Aussie on that day, um, you know, were better than us, and went on to win it. But you know what? Um, they nearly lost the quarter final oh, to mate, Ireland. That was so, a game. You know, at, a, at an event like that, um, you know, it's times you need a bit of luck. And I think uh, Aussie had theirs against Ireland, and they were good enough to go on and and clinch it. Um, you know, we um, we just we just weren't good enough. You know, and look, it's hard. When sometimes you're in the fo- in the forest, you can't see the wood for the trees. So, yeah. you know, as a group, you know, we we we, we probably didn't see it. You know, we knew we weren't playing well, but we probably didn't see um, a lot of the dynamic right. that was going. That was a lot of people thought. We, you know, when you get out of the environment and go away and look at it a little bit less um, passionately, um, and a little bit more objectively, um, you, it's easy now to see where the yeah. fault lies. But you know, sometimes when you're in the middle of it, um, it's not so easy. Yeah, yeah, totally. And um, probably the um, the other really, really big series that you played in your career. Was um, and most players only get one of these. Um, was the '93 Lions tour here, and um, you know, looking at that as well on the clips, the first test was tight. You banged one from forty mm-hmm. um, to get yep. to get over the mark. Was the had the team moved on then, or you um, you know, was there still um, huge anticipation for the Lions to think they might be able to get one on the road? No, oh, no, I mean look, Lions is a massive brand in world rugby, yep. and and part of its appeal, in my view, is its scarcity. They only go out once every four years, and we get them once every 12. Exactly. It's pretty special, and they don't play at home, so that's yeah. <laughs> an interesting um, uh, sort of sidebar. But, um, I mean, uh, that was part of the reason I stayed on. I mean, at the end of 91, I really contemplated retiring. Yeah. I mean, I, I was copping plenty, um, and it wasn't pleasant. Yeah. I mean, I'll, you know, and, and while easy to sit back and say I probably deserved it, 
when you're going through it, it's not yeah. easy. I defy anyone to say, actually, that was okay. Yeah. It hurts, and it hurts the people around you more than it actually hurts you. Um, but once I'd got myself removed from the rugby environment, come home, you know, started to get into the summer, got over the injury that had been troubling me for 12 months, um, finally I thought, you know what, I, um, I love this game, and I, I'm going to keep going. It's what you know, I want to do, so I'm, I'll have another crack. But I was always going to do it for two more years because part of the appeal was playing the Lions. Yep. And I played them in 1983 with Auckland. Yep. No, so, there was, so I was only 10 years later then, one at 93. So it was a great appeal to play against. I mean, we struggled in Christchurch, but part of that is that's our first hit out. They'd been on yep. tour. That's our, you, know, you just assembled yep. a few days out from the game, chuck together and go and play. A side against a side as good as the Lions, so you know we, I guess maybe been lucky that day. We got we got we got spanked in Wellington because yeah. again I don't think mentally we got to where we needed to be, and the Lions were a hell of an up for it. And so that was a tough week preparing in Auckland, um, but again you know after being ten nil down pretty quickly <laughs> at Eden Park, yeah. we won thirty one ten. So we got home comfortably in the end, but it wasn't without a scare early on. Yeah, and watching highlights of that, there's one thing you realise like. That was ferocious. The start of that game was ferocious. They came out of the blocks, yeah. got an early try to Scott Gibbs. Yeah. There was bodies going everywhere. But actually, when you kick on and watch it, you guys played really well. Like, Michael Jones was on another planet. Like, that guy was a hell of an athlete. Lee mm. Stenson has played amazing yeah, coming in did. sort yeah, of from his nowhere. Debut, his debut, wasn't it? Mm. You had a great game. The thing that stuck out, mate, was um, there was a couple of big tackles in there. I think it was Gavin Hastings coming back on the cut, and I was like, who's made that tackle? And it was Grant, me, was it? was Grant Fox Can't jumps. remember. <laughs> didn't, make, didn't make too many. I should remember, shouldn't I? Um, uh, yeah. I just, I remember when we reviewed that game um, from Wellington, I mean, Martin Bayfield, their big, oh, tall lock, he so cleaned big. us out. Yeah. So we had a strategy. We're not kicking the ball out. We're just not giving it to Bayfield, giving Bayfield right. a chance. Right. So we sort of, I remember saying to the forwards in the build-up to the game, I said, you give me the ball going forward, I'll give it back to you going forward, right? And a lot of that was going to be hoisting. So not kicking long, just putting it up high, yep. giving Gav a bit of a workout. Yeah. Um, and that, the strategy, I think, worked for us because, you know, they, they didn't dominate the line out like they had the week before. Yeah. Um, ball on play probably suited us, you know, for longer periods of play probably suited us a little bit more. It's it defi- it divide the... Um, Sort of denied them a lot of set piece starters, yeah. um, loosened the game up a little bit, and you know, look after a shaky opening. We were down, you know, two tries quickly, yeah. down ten nil. I might have been a converted try and a penalty. I can't quite remember. Um, from then on, and we played pretty well. Yeah, no, there's one thing you know. We always you know, sometimes you know when you're overseas, people talk about you know the size of the All Blacks and how big the All Blacks are. But one thing you realise when you go overseas and and when you see. There's some big Englishmen. There's some big Welshmen. There's oh, yeah. some big Scotsmen like Bayfield big Irishmen and, and, and John's big. Ir- they they are big units. Big South Africans. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, I often read the programs nowadays, and you know, weight wise, we we you know we scrub up pretty well, and height wise, pretty yep. well too. But when I look at it, when I stand them side by side, I said it doesn't seem right. Now they no, just seem people aren't as thick no, as they, Dwayne Vermeulen, all no, right? Like he's they very just thick seem, individual. They just <laughs> seem bigger than us, don't they? But yeah, when they, you, again, if you if you believe what's written in the programs, yeah. weight wise and that, we compare pretty well. But it, side by side, yeah. doesn't quite seem right. Yeah, no, mate. It's been an amazing career, and you've you've always stayed close to the game. You've you've done coaching, you've done selecting, you've done commentary. Now you're um, selecting again for the All Blacks. It's just it's just in your blood, isn't it? You just love it. I was brought up with it. Yeah. Um, love the game. Um, um, you know, had the great fortune of playing, had a good, you know, nice long career, you know, um, a great time playing for my country, um, done a little bit of coaching. I fell into coaching accidentally, on, on all honesty. I, was, I can remember um, when I decided I, I'd been um, helping coach Auckland and uh, with Wayne Pivak. Yep. Good to see him doing well too at the moment. Um, so. And and, and Graham Henry had joined us, and so this was at the end of the 2003 season. So I'd had five years with Auckland. Auckland was a real passion for me. Um, not, I was asked to go and help, so I didn't have any design to go and do it. And you know, I was lucky enough to say, "Yeah, we'd, we'd like you to help." We got Ted on board, helped us win two championships in, in our last two years. But at the end of playing North and last game of the round robin phase, and I went to Ted at Eden Park and just on the Saturday morning walked through and said, "Oh, mate, I'm um, going to be chucking it in." I was probably looking for a bit of sympathy from him. He said, "I'm not surprised." I thought, God, I didn't expect that answer. <laughs> and and his experience was, he said, the guy, in his view, people who played the game at a high level struggled with coaching. Right. You know, not not exclusively, but somewhat did because you don't feel like you've got the same amount of influence. So yeah. when you're on the field and you're in the action all the time, you feel you've got some real influence. As a coach, you do everything you think's right, the best you can to prepare, and then sometimes on Saturday it doesn't work, yeah. and you go, "What the hell's going on here?" And that emotional roller coaster was what I really struggled with, yep. and so that was the reason I just I, I I chuck coaching in. I just so it wasn't something I um 
I was particularly seeking, and nor you know a selecting role until I got a call from Steve. And again, it was just a great privilege to, when you think you, you, playing for the team's plenty good enough, yeah. and then you get another chance to be involved again. It was pretty special. Ah, oh, mate, the the 2011 to 2015 period was is a special time, and you're a big part of that. So, mate, what's um. What's on the horizon? Do we? I know nothing's ever concrete in this yeah. COVID world, but like, um, is you know, you aspire to name an All Black team in June or July. We hope to yeah. get some fixtures around yeah. that time of year. We got, we just got a plan, like, like the oh, yeah. season that's going to roll out is going to happen. So you know, we, we went to be playing Fiji and Italy in July. Yep. The Lions tour is on. Remember, so it's, yes. you can't quite get the bigger boys. Um, you know, rugby championship, and then then off to the UK at the end of the year. Um, so fifteen tests planned. Um, whether we get to that's another thing, and you know, humbly, I think that's possibly unlikely because you know the way things have been playing out but we've got to plan accordingly and be prepared for that and uh, we'll just see what unfolds absolutely grant thank you so much for coming in really appreciate it hope to get you in maybe in a you know before you name that first all black team um in the middle of the year appreciate your time i know you're a busy man um and uh really enjoyed the chat cheers mate cheers rob